and uh, next up we have Lars who's been in a lot of big and famous startups in the world like the really big ones we're talking about Uber no yes we're talking about what's up yes and what's the one more Dropbox, yeah, I think it's a very big one. So these are the mo one of the most famous startups in the world. And Lars, what he did last year, he decided to jump on the other side of the table and become a venture capitalist. So now we're going to hear him stories, what he's done inside these big startups and why he has transferred into the VC world. So Lars, please come on up. Let's give him a big hand, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so... Please take a moment to think about the following. Think about your career, let's say in the last 10 years, and what you did that you're most proud of. So during the last 10 years, what did you do in your career that you're most proud of? The kind of thing that if you have grandchildren someday, that they're gonna talk about, hey, my grandmother did this, and my grandfather that father did this. Think about that moment. Now consider this, imagine that's as good as it gets. Imagine that was your peak. That was the best game you ever played. That's a scary thought, right? It's not a good thing. And that's exactly what motivated me to come back to Europe and throw the whole thing away and start over again. So I've been in startups for 17 years and moved back to Europe just recently. And what I was thinking was, what if you know, we can create together something really big. So I took a step back and said, what have I actually learned working for these big companies? And really look at the common denominators between these companies. It comes down to the team, the product, monetization and timing. So I'm gonna share this a little bit, a few points that I've, that I've learned that I'd like to share. The first one is the team. And so these, this is Travis, Drew, and Jan. Travis, I don't know if you saw in the news today, he just raised another three and a half billion dollars from Saudi Arabia, which is just possibly one of the highest valued uh, companies, private companies ever. And it really tells a lot about Travis as a leader and just the, the impact that the leadership has on the company and how you do things differently. So to say as as a venture capital to say, okay, we're looking for really great teams. It's like, what is it you're actually looking for? And what is it that these guys, they did that was really exceptional. And it really was to do things differently. So with hiring, one very common lesson that I think a lot of people will share is that referrals is the best source of new people hiring into the company. Because the people who are working in your company, they already know what the culture is like, what the people are like, and they know who their best five friends or ex-colleagues that they've worked with who would be absolutely amazing at that company. And Travis said, you know what, we want to incentivize that, so we want to give people stock options. Every time you bring somebody in, you refer somebody who gets hired, we give you stock options. It's a very strong motivator. So then suddenly you're motivating somebody to do, to take an action to refer people who have the highest likelihood of success and adding value to the company. At Dropbox, they did the same thing. So we built like a point system and we literally made a massive picture on a wall and we showed how many people were referring X people. So it means it was almost like a, a pyramid scheme. And he said, Peter has referred five people who referred 10 people who referred 20 people. And then we rewarded people that way. So again, doing the same thing, really rewarding people for taking action that adds really high value to the company. And at WhatsApp, it was very easy you just didn't hire anybody. So it was very straightforward. But then you look at these people as well, and you think about the culture. When you talk about, think about the teams, you think about culture. And it was really a projection of the personalities that created the culture in the company. It's almost like the soul of the company is the culture. And I think we'd all agree that it's very difficult to describe what the culture is, even in our own companies. Everybody will have a slightly different way of describing what the culture is, and the really crazy thing about that is the culture almost decides everything in terms of execution, which is what it comes down to at the end of the day, right? And yet it's such a nebulous thing, it's really hard to describe. But my theory is it came down to the people who were really the leaders of the company, everybody looked up to them, 
and admire them and really are inspired by these folks. So you have one end of the scale, you have Travis, which is a very hard culture, it's a very aggressive, very executional culture, I would say. And at the other end of the scale, you have uh, Dropbox, which was a very collegial culture, and it was very much a teamwork spirit culture. And then you have uh, WhatsApp, it was a very sort of, I would say, a simple, keep everything small, um, very sort of, very solid, very, very simple culture, so easy to understand. And the second thing is in terms of the product. So taking some of the lessons from these companies and trying to, when we meet at Balderton, we meet probably 5,000 companies a year. And we try to sort of project what are, the, what are some of the lessons from these, from these companies. And the product is really the common denominator is simplicity. So with Uber, it was if you sort of like had to present a, um, you know, almost like a mantra, it's like any color you want as long as it's black. And this is why you see the same product wherever you go, when you go traveling, you fire up Uber, it's the same product you get everywhere you go. You just intuitively know how to use it now. It also means you can fire up new services, you can launch new services like delivery of food, and you just intuitively, you didn't even know that you already knew it. It's magic. With Dropbox, it really is that it just has to work always. And it's very, very difficult to do. It doesn't seem like it, but just to get the, the files to sync and sharing files and collaborating, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And the challenge that Dropbox had with keeping it really simple was to introduce new products was very difficult because you had to make it really invisible. So, and that's actually a common denominator with Uber as well, where it was as reliable as running water. So it's a little bit of friction there that you want to have as much of a strong experience as possible, but at the same time, you want to keep it really, really simple, almost invisible. That's the contradiction. And with, with WhatsApp, it was no gimmicks. So no bells and whistles, like nothing. All you can do is messaging, and you could see when the recipient received the message and when they were typing, and that's it. And then you have everything in the back end with the encryption, security, etc just making it super, super simple. And that was, that's one of the things that we look at when we meet companies, when we meet people. Okay, how does, what's, what, what problem is this solving? How simple is the execution of the solution here? How scalable is it? And that brings us to the monetization part, which is really the size of the opportunity. And this is one thing I've seen. So I've been back in Europe since, um, since November um, with, with Balderton. And one of the things that I see a lot is that really some of the ideas are just not big enough. While there's a big difference from when I left many years ago, it's still something that we look at and it's just a pure math problem. It means if you have a really big fund, the math really has to add up, and the only way the math adds up is if you have really big, op you're betting on really big opportunities. And this is something that, it's, it's a filter, right? And it's also from the entrepreneur's point of view, it means that you have to really pick the VCs that you go and, and talk to based on actually how big is your idea? Is this a billion dollar idea? You want to talk to the big, to the big teams? Because they can really back you all the way as well, and they will be very interested in it. And these three companies, they had very different ways of approaching monetization, where you had WhatsApp, they said, you know what, we'll just go for scale. We just want as many people as possible using the service, and we'll figure out monetization at some point. There's value in that. And, and this was really driven by Jan, the founder of WhatsApp. He was Ukrainian, and he wanted information to flow freely. He didn't want it to be... Inter, inter, intersected by any government, he, didn't, he just wanted to be pure and free, and he just wanted it to be to everybody. So there's like a very aspirational mission, as you can imagine, to work for a company that wants to do that. And then you had Uber, at the other end of the scale, it's like, you know what, we just want to make money. We want to make a lot of money. We want to build really big, monetizable value. And they are also working in a service that people are already used to build, to pay for, which means you're a lot more, it's a lot easier for you to actually pay for something where the service obviously is better, but cheaper compared to taxi, for example. 
So that's the other end of the extreme where Uber said, okay, we just want to make a lot of money. And WhatsApp said, we just want a lot of distribution. And then you have, what? You have Dropbox in the middle that was a premium service on top of a premium service. So it means you had a lot of people coming in. They just passed 500 million users recently. And then once people, they start to use the service a lot, take it to work as well, people start to pay for it. That's a very smart way to go about things as well. And the, the other thing I would point out here is that actually all three services touch both consumer and business. And that's a really sweet spot to be in. That's something to think about. The final point is around timing. It's really difficult to describe what good timing is. But I think we all know services. We've maybe, I mean, I've certainly experienced being part of companies that were just too early and that blew up because they were too early. And it's depending on a lot of different things. It's like social impact, it's technology, it's platform, it's what people are just used to. There are many, it's really, really difficult to think about good timing, but it really, really matters. And it's something that can't be ignored. So when you fall in love with an idea, launching something, getting it really, really big, it's just like that extra moment to take a step back and think, okay, what's the timing of this? Like, what's this market gonna look like five years from now? Are we following a trend that's growing? Or are we following something that's gonna disappear? It's a really easy place to, to fail because you, love in, you fall in love with this incredible thing you want to launch. And from an investment point of view, of course, Timing is everything. You want to get in at the point where you believe that there's a fair balance between risk and upside and put in the maximum amount of money to reflect that balance. So timing really matters for everyone to think about that. So um, Malcolm Gladwell, who is the, the author of Outliers, which if you have probably a lot of you have already read it. It's an amazing book that talks about how come some people just do so much more than other people. How come they achieve so much more? You look at somebody like Elon Musk, which is like a today's outlier. I mean, he has like three billion dollar companies that he's built. How is that even possible? It's hard enough to build a one billion dollar company. And what is it that makes that drives people to do that? And that's something that we think a lot about a lot as well, like what is driving people to really do something for the second time, for the third time, and you see you know, returning entrepreneurs, etc. What's driving people? And with the three folks that I showed before, it's different things that are driving all three of them. And in moving, uh, referring back to what Yen said in the beginning, in moving from being an entrepreneur to venture capital, from a very personal standpoint, I just want to prove to myself, if nothing else, that I wasn't lucky with picking some companies that are at, at good timing. That's an incredible driver. It comes back to what I, what I mentioned at the beginning, that you don't want the past to be the best that you've done. You always want to do better, right? And, you know, what Daniel mentioned just before as well, with billion dollar companies coming out of Scandinavia, that's something that's an incredible opportunity for all of us to work on. And at Balderson, we hope to be part of that journey. So thank you very much.